Uh, good morning, everyone. It is Monday, March 1st. Happy March 1st. Uh, this is the Public Safety Committee of the Los Angeles City Council. I'm Councilman Smith, Chairman. I'm joined by Councilman Zine. Uh, Ms. Perry and Mr. Reyes are sometime due this morning. We don't know their time, uh, but we have uh, I have a 945 meeting with President of the Council, so I need to uh, move along quickly if we yep. can. So uh, if there's no objection, Mr. Zine will take items number four and five as consent. Those are grant, I mean, excuse me, those are donations. Mr. Steve Needleman, a very generous man. Very well. Okay, those will be approved and uh, with the, uh, with the uh, appreciation of the City Council for those donations. We'll start with item number one, verbal report from LAPD on reserve uh, recruitment efforts and training efforts. Good morning. How are you this morning? Good morning. Lori Gruby, Personnel Commanding Officer, Personnel Group. And Captain Joe Mariani, Commanding Officer, Recruitment and Employment Division. Great. So it was a, just a verbal report on, uh, in case you don't know, you're talking to two reserves, so <laughs> we're kind of a little bit uh, predisposed to uh, seeing something happen over there. But, give uh, you a fair impartial hearing. Yeah, fair impartial hearing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, to give you a little bit of an overview, uh, during the last uh, two fiscal years, um, Recruitment and Employment Division um, in uh, partnership with the Personnel Department has tested uh, 542 uh, reserve officer candidates, and the prior year was 507 for the fiscal year. Currently, the department has 242 level one officers, 12 level two, 145 level threes, and that's as of February 25th. Uh, the personnel department reports that currently there are 158 reserve officer candidates currently in the background process. 25 of those candidates have completed all phases of the selection process. During 2009, the department uh, conducted two level three classes that resulted in 20 graduates. In addition to that, near the latter part of 2009, we began a level two class that is scheduled to graduate in uh, April of this year. Um, there is also a level three class that is planned to, to uh, go underway in May of this year. In terms of our recruitment efforts, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, the reserve program lost its funding for um, uh, advertising for the reserve program. But since that time, uh, Recruitment and Employment Division uh, the recruiters there have taken on um, joint responsibilities to also actively recruit reserve members in tandem with full-time officers. So last year we had about 1,500 formal training events. During those events, recruiters have been trained to give information regarding the reserve program. They take out the necessary materials at pocket test. We give that option for folks to also test uh, to become reserve officers. And oftentimes when we have candidates that don't meet the minimum age requirement for full-time officer, we encourage them to get them in the process to take the reserve exam uh, so that they can at least become a level three uh, reserve officer. In addition to this, uh, we also provide the option for candidates to, to test for reserve officer at the five static locations that are overseen by the personnel department. When we do uh, outreach to military bases, we also include uh, reserve officer materials so that folks can uh, engage and uh, participate in that process. In the last year, we've also had some scripts uh, prepared uh, with the assistance of uh, Englander and their associates, uh, some PSA scripts that were distributed to the um, local media outlets. In addition to that, we have um, four billboards throughout the city that were funded by the uh, Reserve Officer Foundation. We have three very active uh, websites, the joinlapdreserves.com, which goes out to, to reach uh, potential candidates, as well as the lapdreserves.com or .org website. And then we also have a link from the Join LAPD uh, website uh, to those reserve sites. And that's pretty much it. Okay, a couple things. Um, First of all, it looks like we're about around 400 officers, and you're authorized 2,000, I think. 
I think the best way ever was probably about 800, as I recall, a few years back. Yes. Um, as we look toward, and these decisions haven't been made yet, but as we look toward a reduced hiring plan for the full-time officers next year, there would be academy class space available and training a cadre available, I would think, to put more classes through. Uh, the 25 in that just cleared background, is that going to be your level three class you're talking about? That's coming correct. up early. What about level three to two classes? Are there going to be any uh, step-up classes available now to move some of those level threes to two? Well, actually, we are focusing on the level threes as perhaps uh, putting them in positions where they can backfill for our civilians. As you know, our civilians are going to be really hard as we have the early retirement leaving mm -hmm. and uh, we're not able to fill. So one of our strategies was to consider uh, beefing up that recruitment um, instead and, and having them fill area desk positions, non-tactical uh, mm -hmm. positions and detectives and uh, work on getting some of those in there to help out in the civilian. That's uh, an interesting world. idea, very interesting idea. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, well, a, a, if we look at the discussion which we had today and beginning today through the next couple of months will be not hiring even to attrition, which is a proposal before the council, which means the regular deployed force will begin to drop. Although the chief's done an excellent job of moving people out of the, into the streets, eventually we'll see an impact or a decline in people in, the, in black and whites. And so that's where the level ones and twos have the greatest value too. Uh, are, are there any plans to discuss with level threes how many people want to elevate, who want to continue that career ladder upward, versus how many are willing to accept the, and the, the younger and older people who are willing to stay in the level three positions? Councilman, that's been an ongoing offer that's been extended to our level threes. We encourage them to assimilate to level two or even level one. But for many folks, it's also a challenge because it's an added training requirement. Okay. And folks have full-time jobs. They're already making that tremendous commitment. But nonetheless, we continue to urge them and encourage them to assimilate into level two and one. The other thing that we're probably going to be looking at in the very near future, although it's it's been a great opportunity for many of our reserve officers to assimilate into special, specialized assignments, we're also going to encourage folks to uh, possibly consider giving us some field support as numbers begin to dwindle because uh, that's definitely going to be, uh, you know, the foremost priority. Yeah, the problem is the longer you have people in level one positions and level two positions, the less likelihood they are to do the thousand hours a year like you do when you first come out of the academy in, in the first few years there. There's not that many people that do that after a few years on the force. So it's always important to continue to grow that, that number. Um, to your credit, one thing I do I want to commend you on, a couple of years ago when we had the discussion about dropping the, the, the general fund subsidy to recruiting for reserves, it was on the assumption that the department would pick up the requirement and have your regular uh, recruiters recruit reserves. I had gone out one or two times to where they were and nobody knew anything about reserves. Now I, I've checked that and done my own audits and you're doing a fine job, so I appreciate that. Uh, but I think as we look this year, uh, reduced uh, resources that, that reserves can play a bigger role since you're authorized 2,000 of them, whereas the regular side of the department is going to be capped. Uh, it gives us much greater opportunities to grow. So, Mr. Zine. Well, I think it's a great program, number one, and I think you have a great lieutenant back there <laughs> who does a wonderful job, uh, different programs that they've been putting on, the shooting classes. I just took a class Saturday, impound class, it was done by reserves, four reserves out of Foothill Station, and they had probably 30 reserves, different categories, one, two, and three. Uh, divisions don't have the personnel to go out and impound all these cars. DOT doesn't have the personnel. So what they have done is they've instituted a program, the abandoned cars, uh, the cars that cause nuisances in the community, uh, the sitting ducks, the stolen cars. Foothill has a great program where these reserves go out there and do it. Hollywood has a program where they do the vice operations on the weekends. Uh, certain areas have really utilized reserves to, I think, the maximum potential. Other areas haven't really gotten on board, but your lieutenant has done a great job in bringing up training programs for the reserves. A couple of questions I have. The fire department has a CERT program. This talks about recruit reserve police officers and volunteers. Have we ever looked up with the fire department with their CERT program and utilizing some of those CERT members with our volunteer program? Not a all the way reserved, but some program in between where we have volunteers, they've got trained folks in the CERT program. When the massive earthquake strikes, uh, the train crashed, a lot of CERT members participated. Have we ever looked into association 
with the fire department cert program of volunteers coordinating with some of the programs we have? Councilman, not to my knowledge, but uh, that's something. Might be something to look into. Yeah, we can look into. They have a lot of people in the community who are cert trained. Sure. And they're all good law-abiding citizens. It'd be good addition to that if they could help somehow with the volunteerism with the police department in addition to the reserves. And I think you said somewhere somewhere on 400 reserves out of 2,000? 401. 401. Which one, Greg? You and I, which one is the one? <laughs> um, Mitch, last in. Mitch um, And if we look at the level one, two, and three, they used to have tech and specialists. Do they still have those categories? Actually, the tech um, became the, the uh, level threes, and uh, we also had specialists, but those were more volunteers, people with special skills that aren't required to work the mandated uh, two shifts. And they don't wear uniform, but they, all the other ones have uniform. That's correct. And only one and two are armed or three armed also? I don't have the exact number, but I believe uh, out of 104, it's somewhere around 50 of the level three officers that uh, are armed. Okay. And they've gone through additional training in order to do that. Okay. And one, I work the fugitive detail. Uh, Greg works the uh, cold case unit. Uh, there's all kinds of specialties that you can get into. And, uh, our former chief asked that we not appear in uniform <laughs> because of, uh, how we say, publicity-wise. Uh, and we, we jealous because we got the front page. <laughs> we got the front page, baby. <laughs> but we, we enjoy that assignment and working those capacities. Uh, some of the divisions, just it's just like whoever's in charge. When you have a commander in charge, uh, I remember when Kenny Gardner was in charge for a while. God bless him, a great mm -hmm. guy. Um, some people are really motivating, focused on it and they carry down the divisions. In other areas, it's kind of like, well, the reserves are stepchildren. And somehow a better coordination of efforts, because the folks at Foothill who worked there as reserves just had such a positive feeling. And they mentioned West Traffic, where they now have uh, reserve motor officers. So I, I think maybe a better coordination with the divisions, not that your lieutenant's not doing all he can do, but a better coordination with the divisions and showing support for the reserves encouraging because I think if you look around the city you're going to find some divisions are more active than others some have more reserves than others some may think they're a nuisance versus them a benefit but I look at any time we can get those folks to come in and volunteer whether it be Halloween uh, on Hollywood they bring in all the reserves and have a great program with the the wonderful captains there I think it's a great program I try to recruit it all, all the time when I meet people who want to get involved in community activities but I do think that if um, we could do something right now with CERT and reserves, we could help both departments, the fire and police, as both of you guys are going to get hit with this lack of funding. And in the last few years, we've, we've gone to great lengths to improve the relationship with the reserve officer and volunteer section to uh, not increase the accountability of uh, reserve coordinators at the divisional level, but just to give them the kind of training, the information, the availability to use best practices on those successful divisions. So we have continuously done that, and it's one of you know, one of our initiatives also is to to uh, meet the training requirements because it's it's really important for folks to have those skills to be current, and that also includes their viability to work assignments as such too. Yeah, but there's a lot. There's a, there's there's a tremendous resource there that doesn't cost the city a dime when it really comes to getting that, that use of those uh, four four hundred one individuals. So keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. We will follow up with the fire department. Thank you. Thank you. Keep that lieutenant there. He does a great job. And for the record, we've been joined by Ms. Perry. Thank you. And Ms. Perry, we're just completing item number one. I'll have public comment from Dr. Clyde Williams. And we also took four and five as consent items. So, Dr. Williams. Dr. Clyde Williams, uh, 4115 Barrett Road, El Sereno, Northeast LA. Thank you for bringing up certs because the neighborhood councils have been strongly supporting and promoting certs. And I say we had never really heard about the reserves and the volunteers for the police department. So I would highly recommend that the police department get with the neighborhood yeah. council. Yeah, Captain, don't leave. That's a good recommendation that you contact the 80-some neighborhood councils. 90. 90 yeah. even now? Not even. Neighborhood councils and, and let them know about the program. And during the current crisis, I think we're going to be needing as many volunteers as possible. We, 
at least three of our council board members and El Sereno are members of CERTs and have taken training. Several others have also. So we're available. Thank you. Uh, so that, that was pretty much it. Yeah, you took all my <laughs> I took all your notes. I saw your notes, Doctor. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so we'll look at the website and see what the requirements are. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. You're never too old, remember that. Never You're never old. told to be a reserve. Look at Mr. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> I think we do have a little money split. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Item number two. John White, City Clerk, Item 2, Board of Police Commissioners and CEO reports relative to a Homeland Security Preparedness Technical Assistance Grant Award and the amount of $200,000. Good morning, Jason Clean, Office of the CAO. Uh, the Los Angeles Police Department requests authority to accept a $200,000 grant award from the United States Department of Homeland Security for the Homeland Security Preparedness Technical Assistance Program, commonly referred to as Archangel for the period of July 1st, 2008 through June 30th, 2009, and to accept a no-cost extension for the 2008 Archangel Grant, extending the grant award performance period to March 31st, 2010. Grant funds will be used to pay for salaries, fringe benefits, travel, and other operating costs associated with the grant. There is no general fund impact, as the grant does not require the city to provide matching funds. Um, the original term of the grant was from July 1st, 2008 through June 30th, 2009. Unfortunately, the department was not able to expend the funds in this grant term because they were expending funds from the 2007 Archangel program. Funding from that program was exhausted um, on September 30th, 2009. So the grant award period for this grant was changed to October 1st, 2009. Um, the department has ensured me that they will be able to utilize the, the funds associated with this grant by March 31st, 2010. Since not all the grants were expended in the 07, 08 years, were the, were the money still transferred to the department for the salary counts? Yes. Okay, so they just didn't draw down on them? Correct. So that's, was it a paperwork issue or just we weren't, we weren't doing that much after the original big push on our game? Actually, the reason is because that particular grant from the, when it was originally uh, awarded, we started drawing down on it much later than the initial period. Okay. So that's what the problem is. All right. And for the record, if you'd identify yourself. For the record, I'm Captain Horace Frank. I'm the Commanding Officer of Emergency Services Division. Thank you, Captain. Mr. Zang? Um, administrative, we're always talking about administrative costs. How much administrative costs in this? This is an administrative program. Um, for city overhead, there is no cost to the city, as the grant will pay for the salaries and the fringe benefits associated with the positions. There are three positions associated with this. There is a Sergeant 2, a Management Analyst 2, and a Senior Clerk Typist, and the department will be able to fully reimburse the city for those costs. Okay. Ms. Perry? Uh, is uh, indirect cost different than uh, operating cost? Uh, the indirect costs are commonly referred to as normally the related costs, and those are covered with this grant. So I, just, I couldn't understand you. Um, the indirect cost would be commonly referred to as the related costs, um, and those are covered. So the fringe benefits will be reimbursed to the general fund. Very good. If they were only all that good. <laughs> if there's any consolation, we're in the process of securing uh, uh, additional grants to cover employees for future years. Thank I'm leaving tomorrow to go to Washington, D.C. to address those issues. Nice job, Captain Frank. All right, Captain, thank you. My job, sir. <laughs> there are no further questions. That will be approved. Thank you very much. And the final item is item number three. Helicopters, LAFD. You're going to make your nine forty five. Yeah. Are we have Nice. Feel a little more substantive today. Morning. How are you? Morning. Morning, Council Members. Uh, Battalion Chief Patrick Butler, uh, Planning Section, Fire Department. Uh, Battalion Chief Joseph Foley. I'm in charge of the air, oper air operations section for the Fire Department. <laughs> We're uh, here to give you an uh, overview of the LAFD proposed uh, on-call outsourcing program. Uh, a little bit of history about it. The fire department maintains a fleet of six helicopters uh, with uh, pilots and all the specialized equipment. And uh, over the years, there's been uh, agencies in the area who have asked if uh, they could contract or have a retainer fee and, and basically contract out our helicopter services for their city as well. So the department researched this, uh, looked at models where we could outsource our helicopters to other cities on an annual retainer fee, plus uh, 
a uh, hourly operating fee. And uh, we did a lot of research on it. A lot of uh, cities in the area were interested in it. It's a way for them to have a critical resource for us to provide customer service to our surrounding areas and also a way to recover the cost. The fire department would maintain first right of refusal. So we have a fleet of six helicopters. Uh, if we had the availability, we'd provide that service. But in the contract, we would ensure that our city maintains its uh, priority of uh, coverage. Uh, what we would like to do would look at a way to get full cost recovery. <clears throat> Maintaining a fleet of helicopters has annual maintenance fees, and not only that, but FAA requirements require maintenance at uh, hourly increments as, f and as well as uh, actual flight hours. So a lot of our pilots have to maintain their proficiency on several flight missions, training missions, and this would be another model where we could actually recover some of that cost by actually, as well as providing a service. The um, final aspect would be uh, if, in fact, this could even turn into some type of a, uh, uh, a some of a, a business model. If uh, it would be a question for the city attorney, if, if we could actually go into a contract with another city in, in terms of a business model where we would recover in addition to full cost recovery, but maybe some additional fees for it. And so that's the model we're looking at. Uh, Chief Foley from Air Operations has all the background as, as far as the helicopter and our, our pilots and our, and our maintenance schedules. And uh, that's a kind of a snapshot of what we're looking to do and looking at ways to generate revenue for the city with a key resource that uh, is really used throughout the industry. Pretty good. Uh, anything else, Chief? I'm just here to ask, uh, to really answer questions. any operational questions you might have. For Let me ask you uh, really one, and it was an intriguing idea when Chief Fraser first brought it to me. Uh, that's why the motion's here. Um, I've always been concerned that L.A. City and L.A. County really were the mutual aid fire uh, helicopter forces for the entire county and outside the region, actually. Um, so when mutual aid calls, we send, and then we bill, uh, we bill at the hourly cost. What would be then the difference of what a city, let's say a Beverly Hills cover city, would get out of this contract that's above mutual aid then? Well, uh, one of this, a lot of it would be in their non-emergency application of it. An example would be, let's say they want to do some GIS mapping of their city, or they want to have some type of emergency training for their city, but they don't own the helicopters. Uh, so mostly in a non-emergency uh, condition, this would be a, a huge value. The reason this was driven by a lot of cities was a lot of their plans required them to have some type of on-call helicopter service in case their key officials need to come into their EOC or their department commands. How are they going to transport key officials into that city? Uh, in the case, for example, Beverly Hills, we surround them on three sides. Um, it's in the best interest of that city to get up and running, and if we can get their personnel into that city quicker. so we can then focus our resources in other areas. So to answer your question, mostly it would apply in the non-emergency arena. However, there could be times where, where they could make a request for what they would declare as, as their, an emergency for their agency that we need your service. may not necessarily fit the uh, mutual aid requirements, but if we have a service and existing contract with them, we would deliver it. Okay. So. And what about air ambulance? Would this include that? Well, air ambulance could also fall under mutual aid. Um, there, this, could, this could fall under some type of interfacility transport where they may need us to transport patients from one location to another. But uh, I think, Chief Foley, on air ambulance, we fall into some mutual aid agreements with our agencies. Do we, do we really dispatch air, our, our air ambulances for other city uh, on a mutual aid basis? If they do call for us, yes. Really? Have we ever done that? Um, not recently. Uh, yeah. I've it been there seem, three and a half years. But it I, wouldn't seem like something... Oh, I hope they do, but it's always been our concern. My concern is we continue to keep a fleet ready for everyone else's use, and it seems unfair. And I know there's been a lot of discussion in, in Calafco about this, which is a, the, the local formation commission, about the uh, drawing down of resources in areas by certain cities that provide these services and others that say, hey, we don't need to ever invest on that because they've got the fleet. Well, we just call them when we need them. So that really cost us because then we always have to keep the ready fleet, sure. and they, we can't bill them for that. That's correct. Santa Monica, uh, I'm sorry, one of the other cities had reached out to us, and they would would contract for that service to have an air ambulance fleet, and there would be a cost recovery. So that could be a model we could look at. Very interesting. 
Ms. Penny? Yeah. I wanted to ask a question about, you know, mentioning, I think you mentioned opportunities for generating new revenue. When you, this might be naive, but when you provide mutual aid, how do you assess how much to charge the other jurisdiction? We have a, we have cost recovery on our helicopters of what our hourly rates are for those helicopters, and they're pretty much accepted standard through the state. So do you update them on a regular basis? Yes, ma'am. Annually we go through and ensure that all our, you know, fees are updated and that the cost of the fleet and the maintenance, and especially now that we have some newer aircraft, so the pricing increases. And so how will we, how can we look within the framework we already operate to create new opportunities to generate more revenue or new revenue? How would we create? We as a city, using the assets we have and, you know, allowing other jurisdictions to use them. You know, we have a set fee schedule and it seems like it's up to date. So what other opportunities are there out there for us? One item, one option would be to have them on a retainer fee in addition to the hourly rate. That kind of guarantees that they'll have a level of service. And the second way we can recover is that we're required to fly the helicopters regardless because that's part of the proficiency. So we could, in essence, capture some of this cost of already flying for other agencies, for other missions. And so a pilot could gain additional hours doing a GIS mapping flight for another city. And then you mean like charging other departments? Yes, ma'am. Or providing that technical support? Yes, ma'am. And can that also be, that kind of a service be provided to, say, if Culver City wanted to do GIS mapping or whatever, then there's an additional opportunity to charge a fee on top of what would already be charged for the use of the helicopter itself? That would probably get more into the line of the CAO, the CLA, and the city attorney as far as structuring our, if there's any, you know, the profitability side of it. But we would provide that service and it would offset our annual flight hours that we're already flying. So a pilot, for example, who would require to fly up to 15 hours a month, if five hours of those months were made flying a mission for another agency, non-emergency, that's an area where we would recover a cost that we're going to fly anyhow. So I think that's something that we could dig a little deeper on. It's an interesting opportunity. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to work with Mr. Chair on that. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Zank? And the secret number, what's the hourly rate? Well, we have six helicopters. Chief Foley, actually, he updates these often. These, Mr. Smith, these, of our six aircraft, five of them are, we consider, multi-mission, which are large water dropping air ambulance type aircraft. We have two of those are only a year old, so they're going to inquire, or they're going to receive a higher cost recovery per hour than our older 412s, which are, you know, 9 and 11 years old, respectively. So the 412s, on an average, are about $3,000 an hour. That's what includes the pilot cost. And then our AW139s, which are our newest aircraft, they're approximately $5,000 an hour. And what about your Jet Ranger? The small Jet Ranger has very limited capability for passengers. That runs in about $300 to $400 per hour on a cost recovery. $300 to $400 an hour? Yes, sir. That's the discount rate. We'll use that for two. As you know, it's a much smaller aircraft. That's one I've had. It's not really used for transport. It's basically our command and control and training aircraft. Yeah. Okay. But it can carry a passenger. But if you look at the, what is the cost of a helicopter? Like the new water drop? Well, our brand new AW139, we picked it up a year, year and a half ago, was $11,600 delivered. $11,600? $11,600,000. So they're getting quite a discount with this particular process. Yes. Okay. The one last point, too, is there are other industries out there that provide this type of service. There's other, not public agencies, but other companies that do it. One advantage to a fire department is during declared disasters that we have some leeway in operating in controlled airspace. So we would actually be able to actually provide a service where other fleets would be grounded because of the missions we fly. Well, it reminds me of the Metrolink crash 
where they had the uh, helicopters landing, taking people to the hospitals yes. on a continuing rotation basis, yes. which was uh, an isolated incident, but a small city, Glendale, where they had uh, a Metrolink crash or a neighboring city that doesn't have that air operation, that would seem to be the time of situation, I think, that they would call for this, and it wouldn't be a mutual aid. It would be somewhat of another aspect where it's a localized emergency. Obviously, down the road, Metro... Metrolink is going to pay for it. Yes. But the fact is, when the city needs that, some incident takes place versus some major disaster yes. that encompasses this region within a particular community. Uh, other than L.A. City and the sheriffs and L.A. County Fire and LAPD, are there any other operations of air uh, helicopters with the surrounding communities? The only one that I'm aware of that, that uh, we work with on a somewhat limited basis is Ventura. They operate uh, a couple large aircraft as well. So all the Glendale, no, Burbank, nothing County. in LA no. County. Nothing. Okay. No. You Ventura, have small. Ventura County is the closest one. Ventura and Orange have one or two helicopters. That San Diego just picked up one 412 last year, but obviously we're not going to provide service. Not me. As I recall, the city of LA has the largest air fleet in the country, other than the military. Is that correct? If you <laughs> include LA County fire, yes. Yeah. LA County Fire has a couple more. So don't attack us because we're, <laughs> yeah. we're ready. We'll fight back. Yeah. Very good. Good program. Thank so you. if so, this would then go to council for review and approval, and then they'd work up some kind of arrangement and put it out to the neighboring communities, Inglewood, Glendale, Pasadena, et cetera. Yes, sir. And actually, we've worked with the city attorney in the past, uh, Ms. Jackson, on uh, some, some sample contracts and, you know, giving it some forethought. So once, once we would get approval, we would then – kind of put it out there to say any city in the area. And there are cities out there that are interested, especially with the budget constraints now where they want to have helicopters, but they can't afford them. So how do you balance it? And in some cases, we would provide them the service anyhow in an emergency. So I think we're in a good position to move something like this forward. Very good. And for just out of, out of curiosity, um, if we were to contract, let's say, with a Glendale Burbank, we, we could give them a first priority that they wouldn't have to wait for CAL FIRE if there's a large fire on their, in their city or on their borders. Uh, CAL FIRE may be a little slow getting in, and I know there's problems getting some of their contract aircraft up last time. We could provide them faster to them without it being mutual aid? Or uh, actually, something like that. Actually, in initial uh, attack, we would. We have a mutual agreement with uh, Burbank, Glendale, and Brush Fires as it is. Okay, so we're, out there, we're there already. We're there already, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And what, the what, medical would be something different or anything else would be outside. They have to call and request it, yes. Right. Right. Which they have done. Usually three or four times a year they call and ask for air ambulance and or uh, uh, search and rescue capability that we can provide them on a somewhat regular basis, but right. three or four and, times a year. And I, I think Mr. Zine brought up a point we ought to add to the list other than cities would be Metrolink, that they may want to have a contract yeah. with us that we could fulfill that role very quickly for them, at least in the neighboring cities that Metrolink goes through. Yeah. Very good. And with that, uh, if there's no objection, we'll move that. We understand we have a place center today in council because we're taking up police and fire? That's correct. The motion uh, asks that the LAFD report to committee and also that the city attorney report on whether the city can charge other government agencies full cost recovery for services provided. So Ashton, today would be to approve those two yeah, the, requests. Does the city attorney want to make any further comment? Uh, probably would be good to get it on the record. Good morning. Janet Jackson, city attorney's office. Uh, I was available for any questions okay. that you had on this matter. It's something that the fire department had previously been working on mm -hmm. as far as a year ago, and there had been some issues uh, with the CAO's office and the full cost recovery, and we are uh, working on those issues. My understanding is that the city attorney now is opining that we can charge other governments uh, a fee for the service that would exceed full cost recovery. Yes. But not the private sector. Which I believe that is the opinion that our office yeah. has given. Good. So that gives the ability to say to a neighboring city, our cost is really $875. We're going to charge you 1000 That's within the charter rights of the Yes, department. that would be above whatever our cap normally is being charged. With that, we'll move forward then today with a recommendation. The, again, the motion is asking for reports which you've, yeah. you've just received. So the action today would be to do what? To uh, approve. To approve. Well, we're not approving anything because there's nothing before us technically other than a report. Request report back. Do you need authorization of the council to go forward now, or is that the commission that takes this up? 
I think it has to go first to the commission because it has not been approved by the fire commission and then it would go forward at that time with a plan that would actually be presented so, by the department on how to implement this. Yeah, and what we're doing today, we were, we were thanking the department and saying please go forward and come back with us with a final okay. recommendation. Thank you. Did with the you? suggestion that it be put on the agenda Correct. for the fire commission. Right. Great. Thank you very much. That concludes that part of the agenda. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have uh, Dr. Williams once more for public comment. He's gone. All right. So be it. Thank you very much. 945. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Next meeting. <laughs> Okay, what happened? Yeah. Drop your. Well, you dropped your cell phone. Oh, my goodness. Thank you.